Don't be skeptic, hermetic, pathetic, analphabetic, forget old cosmetic, you need new poetic, aesthetic, eclectic, dialectic. Zero points for Europe. Zero points for Europe. The question is, from whom? Where's the audience? Is it in Serbia? Is it in Hungary? Is it in Romania? Bosnia? Or is it in Austria? Um, dear guests and friends, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you in the name of Erste Foundation. My name is Filip Radunovic, and we are hosting tonight the second edition of our European Match Debating Series. Why a European match? As you can read, controversies and encounters. In late 2014, we were discussing within the Erste Foundation uh, about certain topics, critical tendencies in Europe. What's going on in this old continent? As you can all see from the media, it's a lot of mess going on. If you look towards the Mediterranean, people dying on an everyday basis. If you look towards the eastern borders of the EU, Ukraine, people dying. If you look on the Western Balkans, again, if you look in Macedonia, we're again on the brinks of uh, ethnic conflict. If you look at the new geopolitics or the lack of uh, perspective for EU enlargement, it seems very, very desperate. And how these things or those gloomy scenarios have to do, or what do they have to do with the European Song Contest? Why did we decide to go with this topic? Why did we decide to go in this week? Obviously, you know, the week, Vienna, building bridges, it, it made sense after the victory of Conchita Wurst last year, but also because there is a very specific relationship between Austria and the Eurovision Song Contest. If you look through history, if you look in the 60s, 1968, with Karl Gott, a Czech singer representing Austria during the Czech Spring. If you look in the mid-80s, 86, a Jewish singer, Tim Nabrawa, representing Austria again during the Waldheim affair. Or if you look in the year 2000, with a multiracial band representing Austria again, during also, as you remember, uh, the EU sanctions, which came up for the very first time against a new member state. So there are historical reasons, there is a historical context, but as well, um, we can look back at last night. And if you look, if some of you probably have followed up the semifinals, you know that Armenia, Romania, Hungary, they all made it to the finals. And it's very good because all of those countries, they had very strong political messages. We had Voltai from Romania with a very strong message about uh, homeless kids. We had uh, Bogi from Hungary with a song about the anti-war war movement in her country. And then we had also the Armenian genealogy with a very strong message, strong political message about the genocide in Armenia. So what is the whole context, uh, contest about? How do, does, or how are political messages articulated throughout the Eurovision Song Contest? And maybe the most important question for Austria, at least, of all of them is, did Conchita Wurst's win victory last year contribute to some change in the Austrian society? Or is it a symptom? Is her, his victory a symptom for the division between liberal and progressive forms of thinking and living? and the, their opposites. Um, this is maybe the most interesting, most, most compelling question, which some of our guests will answer tonight. And I'm really happy to have them here with us. Some exceptional artists and an exceptional scientist. Um, I would like to thank all of you for making the way, the local guests, and I count Dean as a local one, within Vienna, and our guests from Karlo Vivari and Belgrade, respective Herzegnovi. Thank you for coming. You know it's not that close. But I would like also to emphasize um, our three very, very talented musicians from tonight, classical musicians, who will perform in just a minute. And it's a world premiere. So it's not only Conchita Wurst being able to perform in the state opera, we prepared something for you. And I have also to thank you, to the audience, for your interest, for coming here tonight, to have the really tremendous opportunity to listen to the world premiere of uh, one of the, let's say, more unusual contributions for the Eurovision Song Contest from the year 2012, from Rambo Amadeus, who represented Montenegro with Euro Neuro. Why did we decide to pick up the song, Euro Neuro? Because we wanted to hear a unique vision of Europe, a vision which is vivid and outspoken at the same time, satirical and funny, 
or how the big maestro would say, dialecti, dialectic, eclectic, analphabetic. So in the end, we decided to go with the song for this special occasion because it's civilization's radical voices, the artists, who are the first to offer us alternatives and they're also the first ones who remind us that dreams can and must be fulfilled by all of us. Talking about artists, I would like to draw your attention to our next European match, which will take place on October 8th. And it will also deal with the topic with renowned artists about critical cultural production and civil society in these premises. So please make sure to sign up to our newsletter. And we hope to see you in October here as well. Um, I'm looking forward to a very inspiring discussion tonight. And I have to say thank you. Danke, hvala, jakujem i palike ferat. I hope I did it right. Roma language is not my strong, strong side. And now I would ask on the stage uh, our three artists and thank you for preparing this wonderful piece for us. I had the honor and chance to listen to it a couple of days ago. It's a unique world premiere. And um, please, uh, Jovana Besic, Vedrana Kovac and Rusi Nikov, this flo the floor is yours. Euro Nero by Rambo Amadeus. Euro Nero, don't be skeptic. Hermetic, pathetic. Analphabetic, forget all cosmetic, you need no poetic, aesthetic, eclectic, dialectic. Neuro, neuro, don't be dogmatic, bureaucratic, you need to become pragmatic. Need contribution from the institution to find solution for pollution to, to save, save the, the children, children of the Heute habe Robotnica. Euro, Euro, I don't like snobism. Naturalism. Puritanism. I'm different organism. My heroism is pacifism. Altruism. I'm enjoying bicyclism. It is good for rheumatism. Euro, neuro, I've got no ambition.
So thank you for this wonderful performance. Uh, Rambo, Amadeus, how did you like your song? Apparently I couldn't recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> Was it better than your version? I think that I'm going in future to be more Amadeus, less Rambo. Mm -hmm. If you would perform this song um, at this year's song contest, um, will, we, will we win? <laughs> Dean, what would you think? If Rambo were to perform this song... Yeah, or, or the version we just heard. Oh, no. Which would oh, be more successful. Popra has never won yeah. Eurovision. Okay. Uh, there have been many uh, pop songs with operatic influences that have been performed, but they've never won. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a matter of genre. No big chances. Good. So welcome from my side. Um, as we just heard, excitement is building up in town already. The semi-finals yesterday, the other semi-finals coming up tomorrow. What we will do here today is something completely different. We're going to take a step back and look at the big picture of the European Song Contest. And for this behalf, we have a very unique setting here. This is a panel consisting entirely of ESC participants, whom I will introduce later. They are here not to sing, but to talk, which is probably a rare opportunity for them. And the only person who, is, who has never been on a large stage is right next to me here. This is Dean Vuletic. Can you sing, Dean? Yes. You can. I can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Rambo and I will sing a Dalmatian song later on. What, ki what kind of st what, what style do you <laughs> sing? Pop. Pop song. Of course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I suggest we'll he hear that after the discussion. Yeah. First, we do a little talking. Uh, you are a historian. Yes. You're from Australia. Currently a fellow at uh, Vienna University at the Department of Eastern European History. Exactly. And people call you the Professor Song Contest because Dean Vuletic teaches the only regular university course on the history of the ESC worldwide. That was invented at NYU and now you teach that here in Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, how political is the ESC is the title of our discussion here. Mm -hmm. The rules and regulations say that it is an explicitly non-political context. Is that possible for an event that size? Of course not. Whenever you have nation states involved in a competition, it's bound to be political. So you can't avoid the politics. And the European Broadcasting Union, by insisting that it is an apolitical event, on the one hand, they're right, because the European Broadcasting Union, which organizes Eurovision, is a technical association of national radio and television broadcasts, broadcasters. They first got together in 1950 to um, cooperate on a technical level. So their motivation um, initially was to uh, develop television services in the 1950s, which were then uh, in their infancy. But again, the context was very political. This was an organization born of the Cold War. Eastern Europe had its own equivalent organization. When the Cold War ended, the two organizations merged. But still, the Eurovision Song Contest has always um, been a metaphor for political change, political developments in Europe, despite the European Broadcasting Union still insisting that it is um, apolitical. But it's great because when they say it's apolitical, that actually allows the participants to be very political because that means there are no sanctions. Mm -hmm. Everything's apolitical, so because they're not prepared for things to be political, there is no uh, sanctioning of any political uh, performance. Sometimes lyrics are censored and so on, but generally speaking, um, the European Broadcasting Union uh, lets, lets things go. Um, so it's very interesting how this um, label of this Eurovision Song Contest being apolitical really mm -hmm. you know, functions in a very political way. We just heard this Euro Neuro song a couple of lines 
um, I could quote from their um, monetary breakdowns. It said, um, give me a chance to refinance. If that came yes. from Greece this year, this would be a highly political message, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> Greece, a few years ago, had the song Alcohol is Free. Oh, which really? Also, yeah. <laughs> Um, at least that is still free for Greece and in Greece. Uh, but I think Rampo's song uh, had multiple meanings in 2012 when it was performed in Baku, because first of all, you have the economic crisis in Europe. And Montenegro is a very interesting country because it adopted the euro as its currency without being a member of uh, the Eurozone. So it was very interesting in that respect that this song came from Montenegro, a country with the euro, but a country that is not in the European Union. The other thing is the song contest that year took place in Azerbaijan, and it was extremely controversial because Azerbaijan has an authoritarian government led by Ilham Aliyev, but a government that the European Union, other European organizations, you know, they sometimes gloss over the political problems in that country, the suppression of the political opposition, the restrictions on media freedoms, because Azerbaijan currently has a booming economy based on oil and gas. And um, in 2012, to reflect this economic prosperity, the Azerbaijani government spent a record amount of money on hosting the Eurovision Song Contest. So I think that in that context as well, Rambo's song was also mm -hmm. very critical. Mm -hmm. He found the perfect stage, the perfect historical moment for that. Do you feel understood? <laughs> or is he reading too much into it? Well, <laughs> it is interesting with scientists. They always find some <laughs> meanings somewhere, and nobody expects it. You know. But Rambo, I'm trying to say you're very intelligent. <laughs> well, I, I, can, I can. So take the compliment. I, I, can tell, I can tell in my country they say what the peasant is more uh, stupid, the potato is bigger, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then they didn't invite me to be on Eurovision because uh, I'm clever, then because I'm beautiful and tall, you know. <laughs> right. Okay, time to introduce all of our guests. Um, I will introduce them in chronological order as they um, performed at the EC. ESC. I keep um, muddling that up. Kim Cooper and Tini Keinrad. They represented Austria in the year 2000 at the ESC in Sweden. Then as the Rounder Girls. The Rounder Girls no longer exist after Lynn Kieran, the third of you, tragically passed away two years ago. Uh, the song that you performed there was called All To You, and most people agree it was a good song. Um, were you successful, by the way? Well, I think we got known more yeah. in, in Austria, and we had more gigs and things in Austria because everybody knew who we were. They had seen us on TV. But um, to you talking about political, our song wasn't political at all. We sang a love song, which was... Um, sorry, my earring is making this extra click, which I'll take off. There we go. <laughs> Make the sound man happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we sang a very non-political song. It was a love song. For us, the situation in the country at the time was political, so the song wasn't political. We'll get and, back to and, that, but was, yeah. was it fun? Was it fun in Sweden? Lots of fun. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I mean, it's like being in the Olympics, you mm -hmm. know, basically. This is like the singer Olympics kind mm -hmm. of thing, mm -hmm. you know. It's a, being there is, you know, it doesn't matter if you win. It's and a it, bit bullshit. It, it but was only a, a, a bit. Yeah. <laughs> it was only a, a week and it went by so fast. Yeah. It was right. too much going on. But lots of fun, for sure. Yeah. Both of you still sing. You have a lot of projects going on. You still sing together at times. Um, mm -hmm. Kim, I heard, has a comedy show coming up in, in, in fall calling, mm -hmm. uh, called Germlish. 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 Suck this up, Germlish. Yes. Okay. yes, because uh, I live in Austria, and um, I will never speak German correctly. But um, I just want them to know they will never speak English correctly either. So we have to come to a compromise now, yeah, and we're going to do it in Germanish. So that means we're going to meet mm -hmm. in the middle. So that's what this show is okay. about, where we meet in the middle. Good. Nine years later, in 2009, the EC, ESC took part in Moscow. And Radek Banga, who sits next to you, uh, represented the Czech Republic there with his band Gypsy CZ. 
Um, were you successful? Oh, I think I think really no. I think really no. <laughs> Which but place? We, were you, we, were you, did you come in last or? I don't remember exactly. Mm. All I know, we didn't get any points, probably. Mm -hmm. But that was the mission. Good. That was the mission. We wouldn't came to win. We came to lose. We came to show up. And and have some fun, you know. So we, when we did, we see he got zero points. Like, yeah, yeah, we won. <laughs> <laughs> so fun you had. Um, you still have fun. You still have a successful career. You're not only a hip hopper. You're also a composer for Karel Gott, and you're also yeah. touring with him. So mm. this is the main thing you do these days, right? Yeah, uh, I'm not a only singer, as you say, I'm, I'm a mostly composer, and I mm -hmm. am, I'm a really lucky composer because I'm composing for, uh, you know, artists all around the Czech Republic from all, you know, genres, from, from hip hop to, to pop music. Um, you know, the Carl God, I think it, it was my top, you know, composing level because he's probably the most known singer in, in Czech Republic and maybe, uh, maybe Austria people yeah, know Carl God really, really so much and German people. And I've, grandmother knows. Yeah, grandmother <laughs> yeah, So uh, I've been with Carl God on his tour, which is always a big action because uh, many people come. It's always totally sold out. <coughs> So I really mm -hmm. enjoy to be with Carl Gott. Uh, I think I'm successful in this kind of music. Mm -hmm. Then, Ramba Am Rambo Amadeus. We know a little bit about you already, but not too much. The most important thing you told me is that you own a sailing school and you just do some music on the side. Yes, I'm <laughs> sail instructor and, uh, um, I'm sailing instructor and I noticed that I couldn't earn for a new boat mm -hmm. with sailing. Then, then I start to make that popular music. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a little understatement here because you're of course a star all throughout the Balkans, right? We can better say cometa than, than star. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I'm, because I'm dark I and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, from time to time I'm presenting. Okay, good. Um, Dean, well, um, you mentioned Baku, right? You performed in Baku in 2012. As Dean said, uh, we have an authoritarian regime there uh, who used the stage for propaganda. How did you feel on that stage? Well, I, first of all, when I came in Baku, uh, I felt like I, I go in some space machine and go back 30 years because we have, when I was a child, we have a lot of pictures of the Tito. In, in, in Yugoslavia, and there were some guy, I think the name is uh, Haider Ali or something like that, a lot of his pictures, and I felt, I, I felt at home, like at home. You know? <laughs> it was very cool for me. And also, also I found caviar is very cheap in Baku. <laughs> then I, uh, I spent 15 days in Baku, and I ate almost 15 kilos of caviar. You know? <laughs> And I was so happy. Also, also, I traveled a little around the town and found that Azerbaijan is, when you go five minutes with car out of the heart of the town, it is like in Bielopolje, in Montenegro. It is like <laughs> very same. And uh, they explained to me that in, in Azerbaijan is some kind of cult of personality. Mm -hmm. And I also feel that it is cool because we also in Montenegro have it. You know? mm -hmm. No problem. <laughs> then it means... It, it all was... felt very familiar. And, uh, yes, and uh, uh, what was also funny, when I saw that uh, Eurovision uh, stage and everything, I found it uh, like very kitschy. It was like most kitschy stuff I ever seen in my life. And I thought, aha, okay, it is Azerbaijan design, you know. Because I never before uh, watched uh, Eurovision before they invite me. And, but next year I saw Eurovision in Sweden. And so it is the same design as is Azerbaijan. And, uh, I, <laughs> then I, I conclude that uh, Kitsch is not uh, made by Azerbaijan designers. Then, then yeah, Eurovision. but the Azeris, yeah. they, they even built a whole city, just for part of the city, just for the summons. Isn't that right, Steve? They redeveloped yes? part of the city. Yes, no, it is not. So they, they uh, tore down no, parts, no, no, parts no, no. of town? No, no. What did they uh, do? Uh, Rothschild and Nobel made Baku in the beginning of the 20th century because there were a first naft boom, you know, oil boom. 
because in Caspian Sea they had a lot of oil. And Nobel, Rothschild, and uh, that dudes uh, <laughs> made, made town to remind, remind them on Nizza because they wanted to, <laughs> to feel like they are at home, you know, and dig the oil, of course. And uh, it is so fine designed town, heart of the town. I really like in Anitza with the, with the roof gardens and everything. It is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And they only built one, like uh, one that uh, auditorium big mm -hmm. for the Eurovision, not anymore. Some glass auditorium. So, Dean, is that right? Did they, uh, were there any That's human true. rights violations that, that, that yes, came there with Yes, part of the city was uh, redeveloped. Some old buildings were knocked down and some people were <laughs> transferred against their will. And it was um, a big issue. Uh, human Rights Watch published the whole document on mm -hmm. this. Um, so this area was developed as Rambo co correctly said. I was said. 15 days there. I didn't notice that. Yeah. Please. I can send you the report. That's the job with the scientists here for. Yeah? Um, and this whole new arena was constructed and also uh, a square called the National Flag Square, which at that time had the world's um, tallest flagpole. Mm -hmm. So it was all meant to be very impressive. Uh, nearby, stationed... Uh, Near the arena on the uh, Caspian Sea were navy boats because um, the Azerbaijanis were worried about threats from Iran, the southern neighbor, because Iran had been highly critical of the Eurovision Song Contest. The ambassador, um, Iranian ambassador in Baku, actually left Baku uh, during the period of the Eurovision Song Contest because uh, clerics in Iran had uh, criticized Azerbaijan for, Azerbaijan for holding what they called a gay parade because of the Eurovision Song Contest's big gay following. So there were even protests in Baku, actually, in front of the Iranian embassy um, okay. as well. So there were a lot of uh, tensions with the neighbors mm -hmm. going on. As you mentioned, that they called it gay parades, moving to you in, in Moscow. Yeah. Um, that was a time, 2009, I think it was the same year as the Sochi Olympics, right? And it was a time when, when Putin tried <coughs> to impress the world. Did you feel that when, when, when you performed in Moscow? Was he there? Did you see him? No, I didn't, but I can tell you that, you know, we all felt in Moscow that Russians really want to do it really big. They wanted to, sh you know, show themselves like like it will be the best Eurovision ever and ever. And I've, I have to say, they are pretty good in that because the stage was huge, perfectly performed. Every technique details were perfect. So I must say, however it was negative or positive, it was technically perfect. Mm -hmm. Uh, this uh, we often hear that that the Russians and especially Putin calls this event a gay event, and he means this in a very um, a pejorative way. Uh, did mm -hmm. you feel that at that time? Was it an issue, or did that come up later? You know what we 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 as artists and, and, and Eurovision we didn't feel that, yeah, because we didn't have you know, how to say the, the access to you know to these things we've been just on a stage and we've been really been surrounded by by this you know lights and everything a production and perfect hotel you know this is why we haven't seen it because everything was perfect since the very beginning when you entered the you know the airport since you left you know the russia everything was totally perfect mm -hmm. but i think that was what they wanted us to 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 feel like mm -hmm. you know from the scientific point of view, did they succeed? Did Russia succeed in impressing the world at that time? Yes, they did. I mean, they, had, they set the record for the amount of lead lighting on the stage. Um, yeah. The interval act was Cirque du Soleil. So this was, you know, really affirming Russia as a player, a big player once again on the international stage. And it was also intended to show that uh, Russia was ready to host bigger international events, such as the Sochi Olympic Games. So it was um, a test run for that. And um, Russia had been trying to win the Eurovision Song Contest for a long time. It had entered uh, in the mid-1990s. Um, it had tried uh, 
afterwards with the faux lesbian act tattoo. You know, today we criticize Russia a lot for its anti-gay laws, but there was a time when Russia was trying to win the Eurovision Song Contest with this fake lesbian duo who even um, threatened to kiss on stage. And the European Broadcasting Union said, no, 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 that's not allowed. But of course, you know, that has all changed now. And we've already had mm -hmm. a lesbian kiss on stage um, a few years back. <laughs> So um, Russia was trying really hard in that decade to win the Eurovision Song Contest. And as a result, when it finally did win, it spent a lot of money. But this was a time also when the tensions between the West and Russia weren't mm -hmm. high like they so are So that now. means they wanted to play on the Western playing fields. But these of days, course, yeah. one gets the impression that, that they're trying to pull out already and that they're not that interested in competing on this playing field anymore. Is that I not true? Say Please. Please. Please, if you say that uh, sex freedom is some kind of West uh, uh, culture, I think it is not. I think that uh, uh, sex freedom is some East stuff. India, for example. In India you had uh, sex hrams, you know, some uh, big church uh, which is like with a thousand dicks, balls and pussies, you know, on that. Also, also, I have to remind you that in, in Russia, you had a, a, a com communistic revolution in the uh, beginning of the, of the uh, 20th century, and they had also sexual revolution. And they have architects who build uh, buildings in the beginning of the century to organize life in that buildings that people, they call that buildings phalanx, and they have uh, rooms for the party. Group sex was planned by communist avant-garde to uh, practice in uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, Soviet Union then it means that they somehow they have a bigger uh, bigger uh, experience of the uh, sex freedom than west mm -hmm. when church was strongly always uh, uh, forbidden all kind of, you know, that uh, sex freedom, you know. It's probably true, but this is changing these days, isn't it? Yeah, I, yeah? the anti-gay laws I referred to are uh, the ones that were adopted in 2013 that uh, sanction the promotion of homosexuality to minors. That's what is currently uh, the controversy. But Rambo is right. I don't think we need to necessarily see sexual freedom as just a Western concept or value. You know, there are lots of other examples of this across different cultures, different Already, civilizations. I'm sorry. I, I also think that pushing sexual freedom now in the TV is somehow how twisting of our attention that, that uh, propaganda of sex freedom is somehow uh, trying to hide all another stuff where we are not really free. Mm. And like, okay, free sex, but what is with, 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 with another freedom? So. This is a very fundamental, fundamental question that you're raising here. Um, I'd like to get to Tini and Kim. You performed in Sweden, which is a less controversial place to be. But at the time, Austria, was in the center of European and even global attention. Um, we all remember the EU sanctions mm -hmm. in 2000. Yeah, and the government, or at least the ORF, they sent you to represent this country. How did you feel? Well, uh, we were asked to do this song. We, it wasn't our song. They chose the song first, and then they had a little competition in who is going to sing it. And um, we won this competition before the sanctions. Oh. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, I think we would have taken a different song. But that was not in the question. So we thought, oh, in this case, we're not going to go, because this, this country, we don't want to represent this political system and then we uh, <laughs> yeah it was very hard for us to decide what we're going to do because that was the first thought no 
And the second thought was, but that means that these people that we don't like are telling us what we're going to do. And that's even worse. So we decided, no, okay, we are going, but we are going as a representative of the other part of Austria that didn't vote, and we were more, of course, that didn't vote for this political system because it was a a trap, actually, yeah. the way they did it. Yeah. It, it was, was not really voted that way. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so we have to remember this. And so we thought, uh, so no, we're mm -hmm. not going to let, let us or uh, the Austrian public down in saying, no, we're not going to do this. Mm -hmm. Did you feel used in any way? Or no. did, did, did people give... Yes, yeah. sometimes, yeah. yes, because um, I think what, what, like Tini said, we were um, chosen before the sanctions, but the political situation was boiling up the whole time we were doing it. We spent a lot of time discussing whether we were going to do it or not. With typical women's band, yeah. you know, it's like giving birth every time we did something, so we would have to really discuss it. But... Um, used, I wouldn't say used, but I would say put on the display a bit, and we made it very clear to the ORF that we did, were not going to take any party line that they had written out for us. And I think they were holding their breaths a couple of times, you know, like, what are they going to say, you know? Um, you especially me as a New Yorker. On stage, yeah, of well, course. you know, you they, could have we got more something. questions about Hyder, let's mm. call it a name, than we got about the song, actually. You know, every time we went to an interview, that's what they asked us about. But know. we liked it, remember? We liked I mean, it, we loved it because that we, we could say things, you know, and it was like, you know, thank God Austria doesn't have a secret service that could kill us off, and not in public anyway. So it was cool, you know, and we could say I must that. say that I didn't have the feeling that the ORF was not sure about us because they sent us on purpose. Yeah. They they wanted to put the sign out that yeah. they were against this kind of politics. Politics too. So, so I mean, okay, it's a great word in German Aus uh, Aushängeschilder. So yeah. what, what would you say well, in English? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Poster girls. Poster girls. Poster girls, yeah. So we were like the yeah. poster girls, not only for multiculti but also our figures, because we weren't sticks in and we didn't look like everybody who's we were, there. We yeah. come on. No, of course not, but it... <laughs> it, it <laughs> That's why they call us the rounder the, girls, right? I don't have a problem being a poster girl for something that I believe yeah. in, so yeah. that's why I didn't feel used. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't, I, like I said, I did feel a little bit used. I can't say that I didn't, but what, what, what really scared me was the things that I read online. After that we, is true. After about we you got or about Austria? About or us, yeah. About uh, that was an... Uh, you I mean knew comments from Austrians? Yes, 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 yes. It was really deep, very deep. So that was a bit scary mm -hmm. to know you have to get out there, you know, without, like, a uh, bulletproof vest or something. Mm -hmm. and but, of course, it was clear that, you know, not everybody's on our side because that was the whole point, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to go th through this. Yeah, and you have uh, to but, know the history uh, of this country. And it was, it was an easy job compared to Conchita Wurst, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. yeah. That was yeah. really but bad. But she was not the first. Everybody ke keeps acting like Conchita's the first. We had Dana International. No, 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 no. But no. I mean, these postings, I think Dana was before mm -hmm. this yeah, kind yeah. of internet, before the internet. Uh, <laughs> shit storms <laughs> happened. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. But I find it very interesting to hear that obviously this was a coincidence and it wasn't a plan by the ORF. Oh. Uh, excuse yeah. me, but Dana International is a woman. No, it's a man. No, she man. used to be a man. She used now to be a man. A okay, that she's is a bit of a difference. Yeah. No, she's a woman. Okay, that's she's a woman now. But yeah, that's you know. She's but a woman. she said that she was trans. Sorry, what was the question? Okay. Uh, I, I was surprised to hear that um, sending you <laughs> was not an elaborate plan um, no. by uh, the Austrians, but it, it yeah. somehow happened. It was yes a coincidence. No. Yeah. Um, Dean, Austria has a, large, a, a long tradition of of sending people to the contest to deliver a message there. So I, I'm not totally wrong thinking that there might have been a plan here also. Well, can I say something? <laughs> yes. the, the, the song was before the sanction. The, to send us with the song was in planning, but then the, the, the actual sending was when, when this whole thing happened already. Mm -hmm. So it was both. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because we, we also sang at this huge um, anti 
government, they used to have protests every day. And we actually went there and sang at the protest. And, uh, but not sang, this song. No, we sang, no, song. no, we sang an African song at the protest um, about peace and freedom, you know. So um, I'm not sure the, the ORAF were a bit like, what are they doing? You know, so mm -hmm. they, I think we scared them a bit. But they didn't dare say anything. No, you. they didn't. That's what I admire about them. They didn't say anything. They let us say what we wanted, so mm -hmm. that was really good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm proud of that, that they let us say what we wanted, because so we wouldn't have done it. Dean, from, from the scientific point of view, is Austria a coward, or are they so tolerant, or are they so liberal? What are they? Is there a, a, a <laughs> genuine plan, or, or, or <laughs> do things just happen? I think there are people in ORF who want to present a certain picture of Austria, mm -hmm. and that that has always been the case. If we go back to the 1960s, so Austria entered the Eurovision Song Contest in uh, 1957. But then already in 1961, it sends Jimmy Markulis, a Greek man from Greece who is um, a star in Austria, and he's actually the first Greek in the Eurovision Song Contest, and he's representing Austria. In 1963, Austria sends Carmela Koren, an Israeli singer, to represent it. So this is a big deal so soon after the Holocaust and the Second World War that ORF decides to send an Israeli singer, the first Israeli singer in the Eurovision Song Contest, with Israel itself only uh, first entering in 1973. And then, of course, you know, we have the Rounder Girls, we have Stella Jones, another black singer in 1995, um, lots of Austrian singers in recent years who have migrant backgrounds, and then uh, Conchita Wurst last year. So there really has been a push. Uh, oh, and Tim Nabrauer, 1986, as, as Philip mentioned, an Austrian-Israeli singer in the midst of the uh, Waldheim affair. So there has historically been this um, push by RF to represent a very open, international, and tolerant face of Austria. And I think that it has really been, first of all, to distance Austria from its past in the Second World War, and also from, from Germany. Very interestingly, Austria and Germany do not have a close relationship in voting in the Eurovision Song no. Contest, unlike countries from, from the former Yugoslavia. And secondly, to also present a different face of Austria in recent years uh, to the one that has really been um, that has really been focused on by the international media, and that is the one that has been shaped by the politics of the mm -hmm. far right in this country. Can I ask something? Please. Uh, how it is with the football representation? Can you take the microphone, please? Uh, 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 how, how is with the football uh, uh, representation? How is it with the football pool team? Uh, is there in same time uh, engaged uh, uh, mm. Austria engage uh, foreigner footballers to to play for uh, for uh, national team? Only I recently, think, yeah. only recently, I think, this has happened. I this think that been the I whole think time. that that uh, all that tertial uh, businesses, uh, show business, sport, football, box, rap. Uh, show business, all that stuff is like, it is in, in all world, mm -hmm. in Europe, is some kind of trend that you have people who come from abroad and do that job. My grandma told to me that it is not, too, not very polite to be in show business. She said to me, if you don't uh, learn your school, you will finish like some singer, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think I think that uh, now, post festum, I think it is it is wrong to find some reasons why it is like that. I think it is common to to have to have uh, uh, like in like in a football uh, pool. You have a lot of people abroad who played excellent football and they are they are engaged also with, in show business. You, I think that. You, 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 when you when you go through the through the heart of down, town in Vienna or this diplomacy academy or around, you hardly can uh, can't uh, find some uh, people who can rap like Rambo Amadeus. You know they they don't want to do. You know that is the reason. Now, but now post festum we want to find some uh, hmm, 
important reasons why it But is there like are that. reasons yes. because Austria stands out from other countries. For example, Italians don't send singers who are not Italian. That's just the way it they, has they been. Don't, they don't, uh, the same they goes don't with send anyone on, on Eurovision. They have Sanremo. No, no, they're in Eurovision now once when? again. Uh, since 2010, they've been yes, participating regularly. Yes, but it's only five years. We are talking about last 50 years. They were there from 1956 until 1996 as well, and then they took a pause for some years. So there is a long history of Italy being in the Eurovision Song Contest and always selling, uh, sending Italian singers. The same would go for but yes, Great but Britain. Italy, yeah, but I must, I must Italy say has South, you know. It is easy to find on South <laughs> some people who likes to, to sing. You know? No, but I must say too that, you know, you can't, you, it's, it's easy for you to say that. You're a white male, you know. I mean, the, the, let's go for the elephant in the room. They sent mm -hmm. us because we live in Austria. At the time, it was a right-wing government. So what better to do than send a group with two black girls and an Austrian girl. So, I mean, it's not like, it's not like, um, you know, we're just making up a reason why people would do these things, you know. It, it is a plan. I mean, maybe I'm a conspiracy theorist type of person, but there is a plan going I on. You, I, so I, I don't think you can say that. It's the perfect time to bring, to bring uh, Radek Banga back into the discussion because <laughs> you were put on stage by the Czech Republic at a time as a gypsy when the gypsy question was, was really hot, we had this wall in Ustinad Labem, if I remember that correctly, we had huge turmoil going on. Um, how did that feel for you? Did, you? did you feel put on stage deliberately by the government? Was it a message that was sent to somebody? You know, I think it was both things together. Uh, when we entered the Eurovision, uh, many people don't know that there was a national round year before, but we haven't won, yeah? Because Czech audience would never send a gypsy singer to Eurovision. Let's say it how it is. Because uh, uh, racism in Czech Republic is so deep, so deep. Not only against gypsies, but um, almost against everyone who is different. Jews, Arabians, black people whoever, because Czech people really don't, it's hard for them to expect, accept somebody who is simply different. Today, thing is changing. There is a new generation of young people which, which change things. But it, it's really slow process. Yeah, it's really slow. Of course, because we didn't have a democracy so long, we have only some 20 years, we, we have to learn still. But I have to say, Czech audience would never send a gypsy singer to anything. To be honest, yeah, that's, that's true. So then, next year, Czech television has chosen us without any voting. They picked up us like Gypsy sees it. Is, and I'll tell you the reasons. I'll tell you the reasons. The first reason is we've been only one, and that's paradox, maybe <laughs> most successful Czech band playing in the world. We've been the only band which been, which been uh, you know, ranked in uh, uh, World's Music Charts Europe. Mm -hmm. Only band playing on uh, Glastonbury. Only Czech band. We never said we are gypsy band. We always thought we are Czech band. You know, that's the difference. But we've been always you know, named gypsies. It doesn't matter. Another reason is some people wanted to present Czech Republic like we are not racist. Yeah, we send the gypsies, so we can't be racist. <laughs> yeah. But they are always trying to cover, you know, the truth. The truth is that 70% of Czech, you know, people are racist. That's simple true. They probably will say, no, we are not racist. We are not racist. We just don't like gypsies, blacks, <laughs> Arabians, Asians, <laughs> but we're not racist. But Kim, you know, Kim, Kim mentioned the hate mail that they got when they represented Austria. Did, did you have were there similar experiences? Yeah, uh, for had? example, we had a uh, week before we've been on the Grammy. Yeah, did, that's, this really happened, I swear, on my dad. We've been on the Grammy and some man told me that, you know, nearby the buildings are 100 Nazi because of us. They hail. They have a transparent, we don't want gypsies represent Czech Republic. Yeah, it was really did happen. 
it was it was really funny because I have to say that we we had a big support from television, big support from from medias. It, it you know it looked like there is a small group of people who just trying to help this situation, and group of people which been trying to you know knock us down for any mm -hmm. price. So it was really our representation in, in, in Eurovision was really radical, very radical. Maybe not for Europe, but for Czech Republic, very radical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happened then after the contest when you, when you were last? Well, uh, I think a lot of Czech people went into the pub and drink and been happy. But we've been happy too. I mean, uh, to be honest, Eurovision didn't help us at all. Yeah? Mm. It's, you know, totally... I think upside down because Eurovision has uh, completely destroyed our underground, you know, name. Uh, a lot of festivals told us they don't want us to be uh, on their festival because we've been in Eurovision, yeah. And <laughs> and uh, you know, and the and the racism yeah. and the racism uh, against us in discussions on internet online was much much worse, mm -hmm. you know, after we 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 came because we had you know zero points. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that we all, you know, we could, uh, you know, how to say, we knew it. We knew it's going to be like this. Mm. But we've entered just to, sh just to show that we are not afraid. Mm -hmm. And that we knew there is still a lot of people from Czech Republic which don't agree mm -hmm. with the Nazis, don't agree with, with this Czech traditional racism. There is a, really, I do believe it, there is a lot of people in Czech Republic, I'm talking about maybe three, four million people, which is a really big number, which, you know, they, they change their mm. opinions. And that's so it, it good. did change something. Yeah, and it's positive. Mm -hmm. And also, and I have to say, and, and then I give you yes. back a word, we, we went there with Avan Romale, which in my language means come on gypsies. We've been ch talking with the band, what, what should we say? What should we say? It is the only chance, maybe, maybe that's the only chance where Europe is going to see us. So we said, let's say, not, uh, oh, I'm poor gypsy, everybody is racist, and I'm so poor. No, bullshit. We came and we, <laughs> we said, hey, come on, gypsies from all around Europe, do something, do mm. something positive, be creative, make music, be, go into the schools, be successful, because you see, we are Gypsy Band and we are in Eurovision. Mm -hmm. And that's a big deal. Mm. Can we look like you can relate to this? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I just met him today and I, I see this struggle that's been going on. I mean, for me to, to, to hear that, I mean, what I've learned a different kind of racism here in Europe because it's very clear in America, racism is very clear. You're black, you're white, you're Hispanic, you're Chinese, whatever. Where in Europe, you know, to me, they're all white people and they say, no, but he's from this country or he's from that country, you know. When I first got here and they said, no, we don't like him. I said, why, you know? They said, no, he's from Czechoslovakia. They all look white to me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so to hear about this is, is very good for me. It's very different, you know. In America, it's a different kind of racism. I mean, we have a black president and it's the, the, the racist problems in America that have come out of the woodwork are higher now than when we had a white president. So everybody's like, can't wait for Obama not to be president anymore so we can get back to normal. You Maybe know it's the I mean? same phenomenon that Daradik actually mentioned, that we can now be racist because we have a black president. Yeah, I think that's a that's <laughs> yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. That's a good analogy. <laughs> it's a yeah. promo. It, 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 this is Obama is a promotion. Yeah. Nothing else. It's good promotion. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But me? the reality, but reality is totally different. Mm -hmm. Racism me. against black people in the United States never ended. It's yeah. even worse. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, for me, it was very interesting uh, that uh, Obama. Uh, was uh, um, uh, approaching after we uh, uh, heard for Osama. And I said, oh, they found the guy, Obama, Osama. Mm, it well, was... that's, the, that's the typical racist joke that we have. You know, I mean, you hit it right on the head. That's what Osama, we're fighting against. Obama, yeah. And, yeah, well, and, okay. and he has a, a chief of cabinet, uh, Laden. Laden. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
So you you went maybe right sci- to this part. I'm not scientist. You you maybe uh, uh, find some uh, conclusions yeah. Uh, yeah. To, to, to bring you back in. Uh, you sang this uh, song in in Roma language, at least part of it, didn't you? Yeah, the part. On stage. Yeah, yes. The part. This language question is a big one in the history of the ESC. Dean, yes. how, how do you see that? What, what, what did that change since um, countries are not not anymore required to sing in their national language, but yes. they can choose yes. their language freely? Has that had had an effect on on identity on cultural diversity? Of course it has, and I mean we speak so much about diversity these days in the Eurovision Song Contest. It's almost it is a cliche, essentially, because when we look at language, this year there are hardly any songs that aren't in English. And, um, you know, are this is a problem. Are there any, actually? Are there this of year? Of course, yeah. France. Yeah. Surprise, yeah. surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Portugal as well, <laughs> Italy, and uh, then the Romanian song as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, 10%. Mm-hmm. Not very much. And um, I think this is a problem. When the song contest started, uh, there was no rule, but most countries sang in their official languages. And then the Scandinavians, the Swedes especially, started playing around with English, and so then they had to have a fixed rule. Then in the mid-1970s, they uh, abandoned that rule, which allowed ABBA to sing Waterloo in English and to be very successful. Then um, the rule was brought back, and uh, the rule that an entry must sing in the official national language remained until the late 1990s, and since then uh, there has been no rule, and now most countries Mm -hmm. choose to sing in English. But the ones that don't sing in English, I think, are very interesting. Serbia, for example, the only one to win in recent years in its national language. Um, Most of the countries of the former Yugoslavia actually like, prefer to sing in their Mm-hmm. Uh, official languages, as does Portugal That's an interesting and point. France. Why is that? Uh, are there countries in Europe for whom it is more important than for others to sh- to to show their identity through performing at the EC? The of EC? course, I think for a lot of these countries, let's say from uh, the former Yugoslavia, it has been a way of uh, promoting their national identities, especially after all that happened. You know, the movements for independence, the wars, and so on. Uh, the Eurovision Song Contest was a very important platform to promote their newly independent states. Um, but this, this applied also to other parts of East Europe after the end of the Cold War. Um, Latvia and Estonia, for example, when they staged uh, the Eurovision Song Contest just before their entry into the European Union in 2004, their governments really saw it as a great opportunity to promote a certain image of their countries abroad. So, you know, they got in PR experts, advertising experts, and so on, to decide what was the best way to package this Eurovision Song Contest to present a certain and new image of uh, their countries. Could you call it nation branding, something like that? Absolutely. It was nation branding in those cases and in uh, many other cases, even... With Austria this year, it's nation branding, you know. RF wrote a whole mission statement that they want to present a modern and tolerant uh, image of Austria that's open to the world and so on. I mean, it's sort of strange. Why, Why do you have to try so hard? You know, what's wrong with you that you really need to make this big effort to convince the world that you're all of this? I mean... You are anyway. Well, part of the answer could be tourism. No, no. I don't agree. I mean, look at the statistics for Austrian tourism. Vienna has a huge... We don't need more tourists could in you, Vienna. Can you explain yeah, but, me but, what Montenegro uh, uh, wanted to explain with my song? <laughs> That's the hardest question of the evening. <laughs> I have an answer to that. But you wanted to bring in a donkey, didn't, didn't you tell us a story about the donkey? Because you wanted to say something about Montenegro? Well, donkey is... Uh, you know, everybody, everybody on the flags in the world has some eagles and lions. And, uh, but I didn't see any lion in Montenegro, you know. <laughs> Maybe I bring lion with me, but I never met anyone. 
We don't even have a zoo in Montenegro. <laughs> But I, I met a lot of donkeys. Donkey is a respectful domestic animal. <laughs> And also, also I read, I read the Animal Farm of Orwell, where donkey is most clever guy in, in that, uh, that book, you know. Mm-hmm. Somehow also, I think some, some old book, what is the name? Bible. <laughs> some, some guy came in, a, in a, what is the name? Nazareth, I think. He came also on donkey, yeah. you know. <laughs> That is the reason uh, I didn't pick up a line. <laughs> so, but the, the idea was to promote an image of Montenegro also, wasn't it? Well, to be honest, I wanted to promote image of myself. <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't care at all about anything else, just to win the Eurovision as an unusual guy and to sell a lot of records. <laughs> Uh, chief of TV from Montenegro, he, he was expecting that he will sell a TV broadcast show with me. And the director of touristic organization from Montenegro, he expects a lot of, uh, lot of mad people, uh, unusual young people from all Europe to come in Montenegro to, to see the land when I was born. You know. <laughs> to meet that country when people like me are growing, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was the idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Countries do use this as a platform to promote tourism, don't they? Of course. Yes. In most southern, in most videos for the southern European entries you see Um, pictures of the seaside and the yeah. sun. In most yeah. of the Montenegrin and, videos, and you I see that. And I brought a donkey yeah. in, in Azerbaijan because he, uh, he, he, he had a problem with the passport. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't, they couldn't uh, find uh, proof that he is uh, Montenegrin, you know. <laughs> uh, I couldn't prove it and he couldn't get the passport and he stayed uh, on a... Uh, 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 Dog, dogan, dogana. Customs. <laughs> customs. Customs, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, at this point, I would like to have a look um, in the room, in the audience. Is there anything you would like to add to our discussion? Any questions you might have? Um, this is your chance. Think about it. and um, or Think about it for a couple of minutes. Ah, yes, there is one. Question here, please. Do we have a microphone somewhere? Yes. A gentleman here. Yeah, I have a question for Radha um, Banga. Um, I was wondering whether there were, there were any reactions at all to your having labeled yourself as gypsy. Mm-hmm. I mean, instead of Roma, for instance. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's it. That's a big deal about words, yeah, in Czech Republic. Um, well, uh, my pseudonym, Gypsy, because it's my pseudonym, it, uh, uh, this is how it happened. I was 13 years old, and there was an American guy which was you know, teaching me English, my friend, and he had a, a Czech wife, and uh, we had some conflict, and I re- only word I remember I remembered was gypsy, but I didn't know what it was, because in Czech we say tikan. It's a uh, tikan. It's um, how to say it. Is it a good or better word? Uh, nobody knows actually. But the truth is, we never called ourselves gypsies. We never called ourselves tikan. We, we call ourselves Roma. Yeah, this is how we call ourselves. But I used the gypsy because it was also. As you can see, I'm still trying to be ironical, but also radical. To call myself Gypsy seems to be like a radical pseudonym, because it's not like a good word, I don't mm. know how to say it. Mm. But, it's also saying, but it's also saying that I'm not afraid of that word, that I'm going to, that I'm going to present myself. But of course, uh, the question is the inner reactions, yeah? Inner reactions. Lots of Roma people, 
yeah, convinced me that calling myself gypsy, it's against community, yeah? And I do understand it. But if I don't call myself Tikan or gypsy, uh, I will not get, you know, uh, their, you know, attention. attention. So I wanted to, to get attention from people. That's why I've started to say in Czech, in Czech medias, I never called myself Rom. It, but it was a plan. I call myself Tikan. But I was trying to, I was trying to present that word in a positive way because I've never stolen anything. I'm educated. Uh, I am a really hardworking man. In medias, I cooperate with them. I'm in medias every week, yeah, with a lot of artists. So to present that word, it, 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 it's, uh, the plan is to neutralize the word, yeah. But the reactions, that's a good question, were not good always. You could call yourself a Rambo like me. Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> and no mm. problem. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's true. Anybody else? Robin Gosian, also from Erste Foundation. What potential platform is there for expressing political opinions apart from the lyrics of your song? What kind of free room uh, does the very tight corset of the show leave you? Mm -hmm. Well, in our case, we had more uh, possibilities to talk about politics outside of the show itself. But there was a lot of platforms, a lot of interviews, a lot of newspaper, a lot of possibilities in the media. You were busy explaining Austria, right? <laughs> As you mentioned. <laughs> I'm still thinking about us because you said that, Dean, about why do we have to tell everybody how wonderful we are? Are we that bad? Yeah. I'm still thinking about that. <laughs> it's <just> terrible. <laughs> so no, I, I wasn't talking about how, how good we are. I was talking about the problems that we have, basically. So we were talking about that and what we want to change and what we believe in. Yeah. And there were a lot of um, different political situations, not just us in our year in 2000. There was um, the Israelis who had a, a flag from Syria and uh, they didn't want them to wave this flag, and they were not going to let them go on, and then they did let them go on. Because, Dad, you, you, I wanted to, didn't want to interrupt you, and now I didn't interrupt it's okay. you anyway. It's okay. Uh, we, we it, that, that. That's the two <laughs> things that are listed in what you cannot do yeah. in the song contest. You cannot wave, wave a, flag, a flag, and you cannot uh, set out political symbols like Hakenkreuz or whatever. I mean, you cannot do that. Yeah. yeah. And the only other thing that is forbidden is to bring animals on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> that is the three things that's, that are forbidden. Uh -huh. That's right. Am I, am I right? I forgot. As well as to promote any commercial <laughs> company. Awesome. So when uh -huh. Valentina Monet a few years ago, for example, for San Marino, had this song that she wanted to call the Facebook song, um, oh, yeah. she had to change it to the social oh. network song. Mm -hmm. So things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. But, but I mean, yeah. the, the, the interesting part of this question is, uh, do, do the, the national television stations, do, 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 do they give you any instructions about no. how to behave off stage no. when you're no. sent no. No. to the but contest? But you know you're no. representing, uh, you I know, am. you have to represent and you know that. Yeah. I mean, so if you want to come back home, you're not going to do something really stupid. You know, I am. <laughs> Because you, you do have to come back home. Ask him. <laughs> yeah, ask him. If, ask Rambo. He was nodding. He was nodding. <laughs> if I can react on your, you say the word potential, and we said the word attention. I mean, Conchita, isn't it a, a, a greatest proof that you can get attention only if you're really, really different? Mm. So that's the potential. If, you, if I come as a white boy from Czech Republic, what can I say? I drink beer? I fuck girls. <laughs> what, what can I say? <laughs> you know, that's so I come normal. like so I come like a, if normal. I come like a dark boy from Czech Republic, that makes attention, and then I can, you know, have some potential. Conchita, if it will be a normal girl, would she be successful? Who knows? Even it's a very great song, of course. He's a great or she is. I don't know. She's a great singer, of course. But the potential is being different. 
Yeah. And that this also goes now with what's happening with Kachita about what's happening with same-sex marriages in Europe. Yeah. And it's a discussion is going oh, on. Yeah. So it's also connected to this, I think, that, that this was the year that she happened to win because this is the I, big discussion I, I warned, that's going on. I was warned when I go in Azerbaijan, they said to me to be cool mm -hmm. because Montenegro has some plans. And... I've been cool all the time. I just had <laughs> caviar and uh, like this. And uh, when I came back, uh, after three months, some uh, Azerbaijan businessmen came in my town and now they invest like uh, one billion dollars, not euro, <laughs> in some tourism. You know, they bought some mm -hmm. district and... Uh, it is mm. partly by my song, guys. So the big, <laughs> big plan worked euro. out in the end. They heard euro, yeah. euro, okay, <laughs> let's invest with the dollars, you know. <laughs> I think it, I will get cut of that. Okay. Why not? I'm elder and elder, I, you know. Mm -hmm. I need a new boat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you, do you know that from other participating countries, is, is that normal, that, that performers don't get instructions from home, or, or is it the case in sometimes? What do you think? I think it's certainly the case historically. You know, there are many historical examples. For example, if we take uh, Spain's win in 1968, Spain at a time when it was governed uh, by a dictator, Francisco Franco, so they chose the song La La La. <laughs> <laughs> and initially, the singer meant to sing that song, Juan Manuel Serrat wanted to sing it in Catalan, which was prov politically provocative. Can you translate La 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 into Catalan? That's what I was just about to say. <laughs> okay. Maybe, you know, they crossed the L or something, I don't know, in their spelling of it. No, I'm joking. But the, um, the Catalan singer wanted to sing it in Catalan, which was pro pro politically provocative because Franco's regime suppressed regional cultures and languages in Spain at that time. So then he was removed and they got in this singer, Maciel, who sang and ended up winning. Um, and so there are things like that where, you know, the personality of the singer, the biography, biography of the singer is um, important um, and a decisive factor when uh, the television station decides who it's going to send. And of course, you know, you want, for regimes like that, you want someone who will not uh, be provocative mm -hmm. on the Eurovision stage or, or during the Eurovision week, well, in, in, rather in, than... I don't know if you, if you know the, the te technique of the procedure of the Eurovision broadcast. It goes like this, day before the uh, show, they shoot everything like in a millimeter same as it co uh, it is have to be next day. And they, then it is not live, bro live broadcast. It is like 45 seconds <laughs> delayed. Then if somebody start to bullshit on the stage, uh, parallel play. they put the tape from the yesterday. And the tape from the yesterday goes, and if somebody, for example, like me, uh, start to do something, they switch tape from yesterday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. when I saw that... Uh, well, <laughs> maybe it I helps quit. sometimes <laughs> of your plans then. <laughs> I quit from my plans, you know. <laughs> but maybe it's good for you sometimes, eh? Well, I, because... had, I had experience yeah? with the live broadcast. Lots, yeah, yeah. Yes. That they started to do that because something happened. Of what course. happened? I don't remember. Do remember. It was something like a flag or the something. The professor should know. Yeah, yeah there were protests yeah. against uh, the Franco regime, actually, um, at the uh, song contest held in uh, Denmark in the 1960s, for example. Um, but it was something specific. I think it was Israel who, who waved. They wanted to, I, thi I think I remember, but I'm so bad mm -hmm. with my memories getting worse by the year. And uh, I think they wanted to wave an, uh, an Israeli and... Um, Syrian flag. Not the other ones. Palestinians, thank you, uh -huh. flag. Uh, and that was already too much. Mm -hmm. Although it was a peaceful sign, but it didn't no, matter. It, was, it, it didn't matter. Syrian, and I, and, they, and they, they weren't sure if they would really behave. 
And that's why they started this, I think, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of fear, obviously, in the system. Mm. As well, yes. I Is mean, it so vulnerable? Um, I think that, you know, it's a system that learns to grow as European society becomes accepting of certain political movements and statements. So, um, for example, only a few years ago we had an Israeli Arab singer and an Israeli singer sing together a song in Hebrew, Arabic and English about mm -hmm. Peace. So, you know, yeah. this is already a big improvement. Without waving a flag. Yeah, but, 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 but why is Israel in the song contest? I mean, it's not connected, is okay, it? Okay, now, now I'm really going and, to be the and, professor. No. And now this year, Australia's in it, yeah? Yeah. Your people. So, I mean, how did they get in there, too? You know, <laughs> I mean, that. can we be in it now? Can America officially be in it now? Or? I can answer that. Oh, go ahead, please. I know you got an answer. Go ahead. Europe got the plans. <laughs> 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 no, the Eurovision Song Con well, the European Broadcasting Union membership is based on a very technical definition. You have to be, the country has to be in an area known as the European Broadcasting Area, which includes continental Europe, the western part of the Middle East, the and North Africa. No, it was simply, it's simply a very technical um, definition but you don't see North established by the... Boy hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the professor has to give a lecture and then okay, the so students so, so, so. can ask questions. <laughs> and the other people have to listen. <laughs> and then we'll understand it. <laughs> and so you have this technical definition, which is um, basically set by the International Telecommunication Union, a UN agency, which divides the world into these regions to distribute radio frequencies so that radio frequencies don't interfere with each other, right? So this is why you have this zone, including North Africa and the Western Middle East, because it's all quite geographically close. And Israel is located within this technical definition, so it can participate in the Eurovision Song Contest. North African and other Middle Eastern countries don't participate because Israel is there. So Morocco participated once mm -hmm. in 1980 when Israel did not participate. Oh, okay. Lebanon also had plans to participate um, almost a decade ago, but withdrew because they couldn't do anything about Israel. Um, so this is and Australia. The Australia is an exception to the rules. Oh. They've bet the rules this year because um, they paid a loads of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's always about money. Yeah, it is. You know, a wealthy country, but it's also because. Um, People in Australia, like me, who have this immigrant background, we started watching Eurovision in the 1980s mm -hmm. on a very special television station called SBS, the Special Broadcasting Service, which was established as a multicultural television station for migrant communities. So, you know, my family's from Croatia. They had shows in Croatian. They had shows in Italian with subtitles and so on. And then they showed the Eurovision Song Contest as well. And so it became very popular among the migrant communities. And uh, more recently, it, it has developed a cult following in Australia. So for this reason, it's um, very popular in the country. And this is why they decided to bend the rules this once, which, you know, is all well and good. But I always say Austria's neighbor, Slovakia, is not coming to Eurovision. And, you know, if you want to build bridges, maybe you should start with your neighbors rather than trying to cross the Indian Ocean. Yeah. Now we're getting near this uh, uh, thing that you mentioned before about Austria, I guess, mm. and why we have to say how wonderful we are and that we are building bridges, because we're not. But this is a very good point. So obviously the Australians are the better Europeans um, in, in the way that they care about... Um, minorities and others. Why, why don't we oh, care that oh, much oh, about... That. No, oh, no please, not at no. all. I mean, look at the Australian flag. You still have the Union Jack in the corner, which is a symbol of colonialism, you know, yeah, a colonialism that committed genocide against the indigenous people. Yeah. I it is also look at the branding of Australia, the you know, and in a way it's, you know, it's portraying it as multicultural. You even look at the group they sent, you know, there are black singers as well. Um, the singer Guy Sebastian himself has Asian roots. 
But Australia, you know, still has its problems. You know, there are immigrants also trying to reach Australia on boats, you know, illegally. And Australia sends them to countries like Nauru and Papua New Guinea to have their asylum applications processed. And if their asylum applications are approved, they stay in those countries. So you actually have examples of Iranian gay men who flee Iran, come to Australia, you know, illegally, or try to get to Australia illegally, are then sent to processing camps in Papua New Guinea where homosexuality is illegal. And hey, if their applications are accepted, they get to stay in Papua New Guinea. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the richest countries in the world treats these so people So why like again this. does this sound familiar from a European perspective? Because <laughs> <Of course. laughs> we obviously all we act have a lot in pretty common, similar. Yes. That's exactly. But you brought up the question, why aren't neighboring states participating this year? Why is the Czech Republic not participating? Uh, is it? It is. No, it is. It's Slovakia it is. is not participating. Slovakia. Slovakia. Yeah. Yes. Slovakia. And some others also. How is that? Have lot, people lost interest? Can't they afford to be part no, of this party anymore? I think every country... Anymore? I mean, the Czechs only came for three years, so Radak was the last May case. I say, yeah. uh, um, it's very simple. Uh, you have to understand that uh, in Czech Republic, Eurovision has no history. Yeah? We've entered Eurovision, you know, past years, is, you know, since, since uh, Kabat came and Teresa Kandlova. But for, for Czech people, Eurovision has no price, or no value. They don't really care, you know. That's, that's why we don't have also the national round. Because the Czech audience simply uh, didn't, you know, accept this kind of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, entertainment. That's all. But you did, you had Intervision in uh, Czechoslovakia and Eastern Europe during the Cold War when, you know, yeah, Helena Vondráčková won the first oh, yeah, one in Sopot. Yeah, we did, but this age is gone. It's really, and these, the, you know, I'm, I don't know why is that, but it's true, trust me, for Czech people, Maybe. Eurovision, it's not important. Maybe because really? Eurovision is boring. Maybe. <laughs> or maybe they don't see Europe as being important. Because, sorry, go, go. You know, maybe, maybe, uh, for Czech people, it's very specific that we are very local, you know, in 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 a way we, for example, you have a festivals, you have the still same names. We are we mostly like Czech music, yeah. And so you, I don't know why it happens, but Eurovision maybe that's because it's in English and maybe it's too much for Czech men. I don't know, but simply, and women. <laughs> yeah, but simply <laughs> Czech people don't care. Really, trust me. Yeah, there, he's definitely right. You know, three times the Czech Republic tried before now. The first time they completely were off the mark by sending a rock group, Kabat, yeah, you know, yeah. dressed in like 80s stonewashed denim, singing in Czech. It's, it's bound a, to come you last. Know, Kabat is pop music, you know. Pop. I mean, pop where you drink. Yeah. Pop, it's pop, pop, pop yeah. music. It's, they, they are totally like villages, you know, in Czech Republic. They, yeah, it's it really. It's the most successful band in Czech Republic, but this is how we are. Yeah, yeah. we like it. We like it because <laughs> but it's they, a national band, yeah, not it's a national band. But Czech audience, they <laughs> didn't like understand, it. you know, the concept of Eurovision. Did you have to mm -hmm. say? Then we sent mm -hmm. Teresa Kanlova, which you know, uh, is, is bubble gum pop. Yeah, she she came with with a song. I don't know what, but she was almost naked. She understood, you know, the, the form. <laughs> Of Eurovision, she came there and she understood how to do it. But Kabat, it was totally, you know, yeah. step away from, from what we you know, should do. So the Czechs had the worst record in Eurovision by coming yeah. last almost every time in the semi-finals. Yeah. Um, and that's why they, they didn't come back. But what I think is interesting about the Czech Republic is that, you know, the Czech Republic was really... Um, applauded in the West in the 1990s and in the early 2000s because it was seen as the, you know, best, one of the best performers in the uh, transition, the capitalist and democratic transition, and it had a president who everyone loved around the yeah, world. Yeah, Václav Havel. But then you see the Czechs entering Eurovision at a time when Václav Klaus is president, and yeah. what is Václav Klaus known around the world for? Being a big Eurosceptic, yeah. denying climate change, uh, criticizing gay marriage, even though most Czechs He's stolen supported a it. He's stolen a pen. <laughs> yeah, that's the most uh, famous story about what of what of because he's stolen a pen. Yeah, yeah. There was some I don't know from political session. He just. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> it was a big deal in Czech Republic. Yeah, he's stolen a pen. He's maybe too poor to buy a pen. I don't know. But obviously, for some countries, at some mm. points in history, it was uh, the choice of being either famous in uh, Europe or being famous at the song contests. <laughs> for some countries, like the Czech Republic, it was they were the politically successful at the time, mm. Mm. and for other countries that you mentioned. Um, Latvia, for example, Estonia. It was uh, the EBU that came before the acceptance exactly. in the European yeah. Union. Exactly. And Ireland, for example, in the 1990s won um, many Eurovision Song Contests in that decade. And um, this was a time, though, before the Irish economic boom. And so, you know, this was what the Irish were renowned for at that time, what they were good at. But then when the economic boom came along, Ireland's track record went down because they didn't feel the need to prove themselves anymore. They were proving themselves in other areas. If I can give another example, Croatia has not been in Eurovision since it entered the European Union. So until it entered the European Union, it was always important to be a part of these European events, you know, to show how European Croatia is or wants to be, especially in the 1990s, you know, being part of the West was an integral part of Croatian nationalism, and Croatian Eurovision entries did extremely well in that decade. They were the most successful, successful entries from Central and Eastern Europe. And then when you know, the European integration efforts progress, and then Croatia finally enters the European Union in 2013, now Croatian television doesn't feel the need to go anymore, and this year, Ever since 1961, for the first time, Croatian television will not even broadcast the mm. Eurovision Song Contest. Yes. But isn't that a definition of music uh, in general, that you just need it when you're, when you're feeling bad? <laughs> and when you feel better, you don't need it? I don't it think that, Croatia that is feeling bad now. I think they're feeling <laughs> lost. Because everything that they needed to, wanted to achieve, they've achieved. And now they don't know where they fit in this Europe that they're integrated into or um, in this world. I mean, it was so funny, Rambo. I don't know, did you watch the 2013 contest? Clapas Mora. Hey, miseria. Do you remember that? We could sing it together if you want. No. I <laughs> knew okay. you were going to sing at one point. I, uh, on but Eurovision, I only watch myself. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Yeah. And they sent this very traditional song in 2013, just a few months before Croatia enters the EU, it's this clapper style singing, typical of Dalmatia. And they say, you know, uh, it's this, uh, the title is Miseria, and that's what the people say in Dalmatia when they don't have much or something like that. And he says, you know, I'm just bringing you, I don't have anything to bring you, just two drops of wine. So this is the message you're sending just before you're about to enter the European Union. You know, really, PR advice, you know, advertising managers really needed to be involved at this time to present Croatia as a more confident country, hopeful of its new position in the European Union, but and that wasn't the, the case. Has, have investment from Azerbaijan. <laughs> Congratulations. So, I'd, uh, I'd love, to, I'd love yes. to say just one more thing. Uh, which is also important for, for Czech audience. We all, in, in, many, in many things, uh, Czech people are much more like uh, British, yeah? We are really, really very critical, you know, in, in music industry. I mean, a Czech ear doesn't, you know, t tolerate anything. We simply, if Czech, Czech ear is smart, if we listen to a stupid thing, we just, you know, we just kill it, yeah? Uh, the truth is that the problem for many Czech people is uh, you said very important thing. You said you said boring. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I go. I'll let's get deep into it because it's not boring. I mean, I'm sorry for entering this, but this is my experience from Moscow. We we entered the Eurovision with Gypsy CZ, and uh, to describe you what is that? We are musicians. Oh yeah, we we all play some instruments. Yeah, we all sing. Yeah. yeah. So we came to Moscow. We had a first rehearsal. <coughs> And it, it was like five hours, you know, of waiting for your rehearsal. We were really boring, you know, ourselves. So our musicians, they said, let's go outside and meet some other musicians and let's play with them, do some jam, yeah? So we went outside, there were, you know, these all, you know, backstage, and we started to play the music. This is how we do it, yeah? We play the music and we just been waiting for other artists to, 
you know, join us to the sing, to do rhythm, whatever. But you know, we've been playing 30 minutes and no artist came. And I said, what's wrong? Are we, are we too, too weird or what's wrong? Yeah. yeah so we, we would accept of Israel people. They came with the rhythms and ah, yeah, good. Uh, so I was watching these artists and we've been playing two hours. Nobody joined. Yeah, nobody's joined us. Then the first rehearsal came, and there was some girl from Turkey. And my violinist, he says, mm, she sounds like Shakira. And I say, yeah, it's total perfect copy of Shakira. Then other you know, people came, and it's total copy of, I don't know who, Coldplay. We've seen uh, 15 copies of somebody, but we haven't seen 15 original mm -hmm. Performances. I mean, I was asking myself, who are they? Yeah, what is so original on them? I mean, they've been great singers. They've been great singers, but not great talents. And then after second rehearsal, we found out that even they can sing, they can, they can copy every everybody in the world in in a way, very perfect singers. Yeah, but they are not artists. They are not. They are in Eurovision in Moscow. You've seen that the performance. It's much more important than the music. Now it is like in circus. Yeah, they it's like a circus. Jumping, fire, Ooh, everything. No, yes. there's a screen, LCDs, jumping, it showing is, everything. Ooh. It is because, but, because. But where is the music? You know, where, where is where is the talent? Where is the originality? It is forbidden. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it is forbidden. Yeah. Originality, talent, uh, all kind of messages. Everything that's why, is forbidden. and that's why Czech people don't don't uh, you know care. Because we can hear it. We don't care because we don't see talents. We see just boring 15 artists. Sometimes it's expected, for example, I have to say that uh, Conchita, it's a talent. Yeah, it is a talent. She, she can sing. Yeah, she's, she's, you know, original. But mostly you mean just copies. That's my way of opinion. So this leads to my very last question that I have to you. If not, somebody else wants to use this very last chance. Yes. yes, I'll take one more question. Hi. Uh, any comments about uh, Eurovision motto building bridges while at the same time the European Union is going to the direction of shooting the boats with migrants? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Especially as we're talking about Northern Africa. Yeah? Yeah. This is a very specific irony to this story that you just told us, that exactly. this region is part of the EBU, and yeah, we're, we're, we're having a, v a war right there. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, no, I completely agree with you. That's another example. You know, I mentioned Slovakia. What does it take to hire a bus from Bratislava and send a singer to Vienna? It doesn't take that much, I think. You can do it. We don't have Bosnia and Herzegovina. We don't have Croatia. We don't have Turkey. These countries that have so many migrant communities in Austria that are so important for Austrian multiculturalism. Then, of course, we have yeah the fact that there are these migrants um, in the Mediterranean Sea dying. So what are we talking about building bridges for when we have all of these problems? Mm -hmm. Especially when you talk about the migrants and they're coming from North Africa. Um, you know, everybody wants like that black person mm. in the group, yeah, but they don't want you to come live there. Yeah. They want you to be on the stage and do your thing and go home. <laughs> on the other hand, I have to say that this year, you know, there are also some songs that are very valuable and politically and socially symbolic. If you look at the Romanian entry, for example, it's a story of immigration mm. about all the Romanian children who are left behind in Romania because their parents have to go to work abroad mm -hmm. and that is also you know a very powerful um, a very powerful message mm -hmm. which really lead, leads us to the question that I wanted to ask which is um, if it were up to you to decide what kind of song would the song contest need this year to win you mean. no just to well, what would you like to, what would you like to put on the stage for mm. millions of people to hear? Well, I mean, uh, Eurovision mostly needs uh, somebody, as I said, somebody who is original, because I believe 
this is more important to, to bring. If Eurovision can help, you know, some kind of artist, uh, Eurovision should help the artist which has skills. This is, this is what I really think. If, if somebody has skills, he's going to bring a good lyric, he's going to bring a good kind of singing, but mostly for me, which is important, originality. You know, because music industry has to be in evolution, not just, you know, be in a circle of some... I mean, look at me, I, I know I don't look like a pop boy. Yeah. I don't want to. I just want to look like that because I like hip hop. I don't want to be nice. I don't want to have, you know, super boots with gold. I don't want to have LCDs. All I. You didn't, you didn't win. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's, but he's right. He's right. Yeah. I, if I would be a girl, for me, it would be more important not to, to show my body. Why not? I have to, sh I have to show my. <laughs> Because I don't need a boat, <laughs> you know. No, I'm, I'm really serious in that. Let's bring some talents. Let's bring somebody who has skills, not mm -hmm. a good, you know, mouse. <laughs> what about the others? I think that's a very good point. Less dresses that you can yeah. light up and uh, whatever, and less show elements, and more music would be nice. Yeah. And and yeah, why not more politics? I don't mind. <laughs> I, think, I think first uh, what they have to do is to cut that, uh, uh, that sport with the playback. Now Eurovision is, I don't yes, know yes, if you yes, know, that's a good everything point. is playback. Mm -hmm. Then it means that you can put on the stage people who are not musicians. Oh, you yeah. can put sportists, uh, circus guys, yes. who are yes. 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 So and everything, point. you know. And, and that is... Uh, that, uh, that is not music at all. It is mm. like some kind of Fontana, Kitsch Fontana with, uh, yeah. with some gymnastic sport, uh, everything, but without music. And uh, first, second, uh, Eurovision should be taken out from the uh, TV bureaucrats. Because TV, national TV bureaucrats are people who are afraid for their chairs. They have a big salaries. And they don't want to give anything which is originally, which, is, which has a message, because they put themselves in a danger. Yeah, and that risk. original yeah. message should, uh, should uh, uh, twist their chair, you know. And if you put out from the government TVs, you will have more freedom. Uh, third, Eurovision needs uh, need some kind of, how do you say, director. Some kind of artistic director, for example, I would like very much to see Bjork as artistic director of Eurovision, or maybe Marina Avramovic, or maybe some uh, respectful artist from the Europe. Now we have a very big, very huge uh, kind of show seen by uh, hundreds of millions of people without doctrina, Without ideology, without misia, mm -hmm. without uh, uh, without concept. Mm -hmm. Good. So and more, more concept it's, it start to it's the, it start to remind on uh, on that uh, 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 world uh, world championship of the Latino dance or the world championship on a ska skating dance. Mm -hmm. Can, my grandpa, yeah. <laughs> my grandpa is watching skating dance. Because he is demented, <laughs> <laughs> and he he doesn't feel that he missed something there, you know. Kim, you have an audience of hundred million people. What would you like to put on the stage? For exactly them? what goes on the stage, because that's up to the country. That's up to you. I'm mm -hmm. from America, and you know, mm -hmm. I believe you have free choice to do what you want to do. Now, everybody's artists up here, and that's great to be an artist, yeah. But a lot of normal people want the glitz, the glamour, and they want that kitschic stage, yeah. They want you to wear all them 20 million dresses because you don't see that on normal TV. And when you watch MTV, you have 20 million white boys singing in je ripped up jeans and pissing and moaning, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with black singers who can sing 20 million notes, okay. And they all begin to sound alike. Yeah. 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 Okay. So 
you know, this is really a change. It's something very different that the Eurovision con uh, contest, and that's what makes it kitschig. And for me as an American, when I first saw it, and people were singing in 20 different languages, I thought, what the hell is going mm, on? Exactly. How do they understand what's happening, yeah? Mm. But it didn't matter because the dresses were pretty. Okay, the music was fine. You could bang your head to it and it was all right, you know. And I think if you want to be political, be political. If you don't want to be political, don't be political. But if you change it, you're going to le keep losing more people because that's why what, there's the biggest gay following, yeah? It's gay TV poor. And it's wonderful that, it's, it, that it is and it's so accepted and that so many countries can get together and do something that means absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm. Can the professor add anything to that? No, I like what Kim just said. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think that this year, look, I think the Eurovision Song Contest is a pedagogical function. I use it to teach European history. I show my students music videos from Eurovision and get them talking about European issues in that way. And this is what is the strength of the Eurovision Song Contest. Last year, 200 million people watched it. And those people started to think about issues that last year's Eurovision Song Contest um, motivated them to think about, you know, tensions between Russia and the West, you know, which were obviously played out at Eurovision through Conchita Wurst, through the booing from the audience when the Russian mm. song sang. You know, then they see Conchita Wurst, they think about Austria, they think about sexual minorities. You know, it prompts Europeans to think about each other. When do Europeans see Montenegro on TV apart from at the Eurovision Song Contest? They don't. When did Europeans start thinking about Azerbaijan until 2012 and thinking that Azerbaijan might be a part of Europe because Azerbaijan sees itself as a part of Europe, actually? Most Europeans, you know, still do not see Azerbaijan as a part of Europe, though. But, you know, they think about it when they see Azerbaijan at the Eurovision Song Contest. So this is, I think, the um, great function of the Euro Eurovision Song Contest, that it makes Europeans think about things and talk about things. <laughs> 200 million of them all at the same time. Um, when it goes, what would I like to see in Eurovision this year? I'm actually quite happy with what I saw last night. The, the Hungarian song, anti-war, went through to the final. The Romanian song, talking about the children left behind in Romania by their parents who have to emigrate, went through to the final. Um, Nature Girl, I don't remember who it was, but she's been to Nature Girl. Yeah, with the feathers and The Georgian, no, was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, looked the like warrior, a bird. warrior song, yeah. That goes mm -hmm. a bit against the anti-war. <laughs> message that I'm trying to send to you, but yeah, yeah, no, no, no. There were, and so there were some very um, strong messages last night. The Finnish group didn't go through, but I think that's more about genre, the punk song that they chose, rather than the fact that they they have Down syndrome and, and and autism. But you know, to see them on stage was also very um, uplifting, and I think mm. that that's what it should be about. You know, yeah. It's 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 about like like you drink a lemonade if, if you know what we maybe are trying to say is okay if I just come to the shop and I just you know buy a bottle which is beautiful then I open it and it's a shit drink it you know it's a shit then why the cover you know it can have you know not mm. a nice cover but a good lemonade but if it, had, it it has a good lemonade and good cover then why not. Yeah, the lights, the LCDs, why not? But I want to also have this good lemonade. Mm. No. So, anyway, I, I think it's safe to say that most of us will be watching on Saturday evening. At least I will do that. And yes. after what I've... I'm sorry? He, Rambo won't. He won't, okay. Everybody except Rambo will watch the show on Saturday evening. Of course not. And at least for, for, for myself I can say... <laughs> that after what I've heard today, um, I will watch it through with different eyes than before, and I'm very much looking forward to that. I thank you all thank you. for thank this you. beautiful you. discussion. I thank you all for being here. And the best thing we can do now, I think, is listen to the song once more that we heard in the beginning, Euro, oh, yeah. Euro. Are the artists still there? Yes. Please. Yeah. We <laughs> did, we did.
Hermetic, pathetic, analphabetic, forget all cosmetic, you need no poetic, aesthetic, eclectic, dialectic. Neuro, neuro, don't be dogmatic, bureaucratic, you need to become pragmatic. Automatic. Need contribution from the institution. To find solution for pollution. To, to save, save the children, children of the revolution. revolution. Monetary break then. Euro, 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 euro. Give me chance to refinance. Blaue Grote Ausflug durch Janica. Heute habe Robotnica. Euro, euro, I've done a protism. Puritanism, I'm different organism. My Peruism is pacifism. Altruism, I'm enjoying bicyclism. Liberalism, tourism, mutism, optimism. It is good for rheumatism. Euro, euro, I've got no ambition. My position in a competition with a condition. <laughs> different mission, different school. I've got only one rule. Always stay cool. Like a swimming pool. Euro, 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 euro. Monetary break dance. Euro, 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 euro. Give me chance to refinance. Monetary breakdance, neuro, euro, neuro. 